good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, as I'm sure you just heard, uh, my name is David Dent, um, uh, and I just want to share initially a little bit of why um, why I'm here and talking to you. Um, so first of all, uh, and I think importantly, I'm a person who has a disability. Uh, I'm a wheelchair user. Um, I um, my kind of history was I, I worked both in the health service and in the military medical services. Um, and I sustained a traumatic injury, um, which resulted in my disability. So I acquired a disability um, and um, more latterly have kind of moved from a world where um, I, I didn't have to consider any of those elements um, and into a world where I, I did and do on a daily basis. Um, so as a clinician, my role was trauma management and critical care. Um, so again, I had a significant amount of experience um, uh, looking after patients, looking after casualties. Um, some had you know, long-term um, conditions, some had life-changing conditions. Um, and now I work for a, a clinical research organization, Parkcel, as you can see here. Um, a little bit further to that kind of background as to why I'm specifically talking about this subject. Um, I, I'm also an honorary professor at the University of Stirling, um, an entrepreneur in residence at the University of Nottingham. Um, and here in our company, uh, I co-lead a disability strategy group with my colleague, uh, Ros Round. Um, so I've been asked to talk really about exploring disability inclusivity to diversify clinical studies. Um, and um, as an organization on behalf of our sponsors, we, we run obviously, as you will imagine or know, um, a quite a number of, of, of studies. But what we see universally, unless the disease being studied um, with a novel treatment or, or a novel approach um, uh, is specifically targeted at a medical condition that causes a disability. We don't see a lot of um, disability within clinical research. And, and I think as well, broadly in the disability community, um, we do understand that um, obviously every disability is pretty much individual just in the same way as we try not to treat other minority groups as a homogenous mass by their ethnicity or by their gender. Um, there, is, there is a diversity within that, within that uh, minority group. So, so why does this become relevant for, for clinical research? And, and why, in my belief, um, is the um, people with disability maybe disadvantaged even more than other people. So I think that there's some there's some broader context here and then there's some specific elements to do with um, the world of research. I think the broader um, context is generally in healthcare delivery. Um, healthcare professionals don't have a lot of experience of interacting with people who have a severe or a complex disability. Um, and quite often there is a sort of negative approach, negative thought pattern, um, a sort of paternalistic approach even to um, uh, engaging uh, people with disability. Uh, quite often disability is seen as a medical condition to solve, um, not necessarily part of somebody's identity um, and, and part of how we um, approach the world. Um, so within that context, approximately a quarter of the population has a disability and, and as i say that might be a an obvious visible disability like i have using a wheelchair it may be a hidden disability um, it may be a temporary disability um, it could be lifelong it could be acquired it could be derived from a medical or clinical condition but it doesn't necessarily have to be um, but just understanding that of the population the general population who ultimately are going to be receiving these treatments, there, there is approximately a quarter of that population um, who, who have or will have, you know, a disability. Um, and within that group, there, there is a disproportionate disparity um, of poverty, um, both financial poverty 
and poverty of care. Um, and then if you take a further step forward, if you also are part of another minority group, um, and this is the same across all minorities, not just the disability minority, um, there is this concept of intersectionality, um, which was first um, coined really when looking at the intersectionality of African-American women um, and, and how that one, one minority group adding on another facet of another minority group further disadvantages people. So, so again, if you think, and, and, and it's additive. So if you think, if, if, if you were um, um, an African-American woman with a disability, then you're gonna be more disadvantaged, you know, than being a woman, um, you know, on, on its own. And this is a, a societal um, context that I'm giving, not um, purely a, a clinical research context. Um, so then when we look at when we look at trial designs, ultimately we want medicines that are going in to treat the general population in its diverse, you know, um, being that as as we exist in the in the world today. Um, so within a clinical um, study or within what we're trying to design, there's always this talent, uh, this tension of balancing heterogeneity. Um, uh, and the ability to generate that data that is personal, you know, personalizable to a broad general population, but of real world patients with those disabilities. Um, but to a degree, you want a homogenous sample of, uh, of, of um, sample subjects because you want to reduce the noise in the data. You want to have a clear clinical and statistical signal. So it's always this balance between the two. Um, and I think generally there is a concern if you have more of a population that, that is, is like it is in the real world, um, then you are gonna introduce variability um, within the data, which then may mean a larger sample size to be able to prove that sort of outcome that you're looking for. So there is this dichotomy and balance that already exists. Um, now, with the importance of diversity and, you know, um, within um, clinical research, you know, the whole reason we're talking here today, um, we, there has been great moves forward. Um, you know, most trials now report diversity by age, by race, by ethnic group, by gender. Um, however, the data on disability is still lacking from that reporting. Um, and and it's something that um, even in January this year, um, the uh, US president um, uh, gave an executive order for the executive agencies in the US to make sure that they take into consideration um, disability as, as one of those groups. So I think as the agencies progress, um, as they think about how they're going to do this around the world, um, this is gonna become more relevant um, to what we're doing. So I think there is a recognition generally, ethically, um, that there's a need to be equitable in healthcare for people with disabilities. Um, and, and there is a need to educate the healthcare workforce. Um, and, and this has been reasonably well researched um, in terms of the biases and particularly the unconscious biases that come up. Um, uh, I'm going to... Um, keep talking because um, my screen has gone away. But um, yeah, the healthcare disparities within patients Hello, I hope you can hear me again. Um, so as I was saying, you know, the disparities within within healthcare are fairly universal, um, and then that translates into um, in, into research as our as our PIs, particularly um, primary investigators, um, conduct that research as part of their normal um, care. But also, when I was just referring to unconscious bias within the clinical community. Um, there, there is also been studied and shown an underrepresentation of healthcare professionals with disabilities. 
Um, so you're not getting necessarily that authentic insight. Um, and, you know, even the United Nations very important report in 2019 on disability um, does report that there are attitudinal barriers which compromise access to healthcare in general. And I think we can probably agree that, that there is a de degree of compromise um, for people participating in clinical research. So disability inclusion, I think what is the problem? And, and as with some of these complex multifaceted challenges that we face, and I guess this is why this has not been solved to a degree, um, is, is it, it, it cuts across a number of domains. So people with disabilities, you know, um, they have the largest health disparity um, if we take the USA, for example. Um, but, but where do the problems start as it relates to sort of research as well as healthcare? So exclusion is the first element. So people with disabilities remain left out of a lot of initiatives um, to increase diversity in, in research populations because other things have been prioritized. Um, and, it, and it's a challenging problem to deal with. Then we have the global context of society. Um, we know for people with disability in societies around the world in general, there is a pervasiveness of discrimination based on that disability. Um, Minkler et al. did a, a, a piece of research and 90% of their respondents reported that they had experienced discrimination based on their disability. And I think that data really quite surprises people. Um, and then there is an element of engagement you know, strong communities, whether that's a race-based community, an LGBTQ plus community, you know, a women, uh, female community, um, you know, we know that strong communities, they know their history, they have that inside authentic voice of what has happened for them and to them. Um, and they understand what is different about how they are treated. Um, and, and, quite often there is a great wealth of knowledge and information there um, which um, is not really tapped into. So there's a lot of, um, of, of decisions being made without necessarily including the people that are most directly affected. So I wanted to then share a little bit, take a step deeper into this and look at some of the, the practical barriers. So if you're going to conduct your clinical research you know, you've you've written your protocol. Um, you're you're getting ready to um, go into um, startup and clinical conduct. Um, one of the first barriers that comes into place is actually exclusion criteria. So participation for people with disabilities in research um, is limited because of the comorbidity exclusion criteria in clinical research. So I think the first step is we need to look at protocols. We need to understand. You know, is that a valid exclusion? Um, is is it is it? Are we taking that decision in a balanced way, knowing that if we go too far, it may be exclusionary? Um, and and look at how that how that does. Um, I think that the the second barrier as well is, and I'll come on to this a little later, um, is a lot of those decisions may may are made by a principal investigator. Um, and, and the FDA certainly and, and many others recommend that, that it, it be in the opinion of the investigator whether a person is included or not, but really without any guidance, um, apart from obviously their own extensive clinical experience. I think the second challenge that we have um, is, is IR, IRBs, for example. Um, there is some research by Locarno that shows that, that IRBs can be overly protective um, and, and this does um, ensue a risk that we exclude people where we wouldn't necessarily want to exclude them. So if I take an example, somebody who, who has acquired um, blindness from trauma, um, quite often they will be excluded from a clinical research and for two reasons. One is that the PI may not feel that that's um, uh, that, that they want to have that person participating. But the other things is the way that we test and analyze um, and share information, it may not be accommodated um, for people who are blind. Um, but there may not be any medical or clinical reason why they couldn't be a participant. 
particularly when we come to um, mental health and psychological injury and men mental illness, um, uh, and, as, and as well as people who are not neurotypical, um, there is a lot of questions around competency, um, the, the intellectual and psychiatric competency um, of people um, as it comes to their informed consent. Um, we talked a little bit about, or I talked a little bit about the socio-cultural barriers. Um, unconscious bias is a, is a thing that, that you, know, you will hear from everybody today about how that impacts, I am sure. Um, but, but, but it plays um, an important role um, in, in um, people with disability becoming an underrepresented um, community in research and probably overrepresented in ultimately the treatments that are going to come out um, and help, um, help various diseases that they may have. And then the final element, really, I just wanted to talk about practical barriers is, is that we think in the medical model. Um, so, so there is a lot of discussion around how disability is classified in a medical model um, and not necessarily a social model. Um, so a lot of people in the healthcare professions, they view disabilities as, as personal traits or problems that need to be cured. Um, and, and that's not necessarily what needs to happen. Um, you know, and, and you can go back in history of various fairly appalling initiatives um, that, that have gone, particularly the turn of the last century, um, where um, it was very much seen as a problem to solve um, and to try and ensure that, you know, the amount of people born with a disability, for example, was less um, and to, through various approaches, um, which I think is well known now as, as being a very unethical approach. Um, so it's this conventional thinking that disability equates to sickness and disease and people with disability don't have a happy life. They're not very pro productive. We need to care for them and not put them through anything unnecessary. So this is this kind of medical model with a kind of paternalistic overlay. Um, so what can we do about improving it? So I've talked a lot about the problem and the challenge and, and and I'm sorry that that's maybe a little on the downside, but let's let's look more prospectively and, and positively. Um, so some of the things that I wanted to suggest to to you that that we could do as a as a global community to improve um, diversity and inclusion, particularly around disability. Um, so we need to make healthcare research um, accessible. Um, to disability and just like we would as employers you know we need to make sure that relevant accommodations are made that we make things easier we make things accessible both physically you know intellectually and socially um, so that's the first step just normal accessibility um, this is going to cost money you know so we have to think about how to make this change um, and ultimately change practice improve practice with anything, it, it will require investment. So where does that investment come from? Who funds that? Who supports it um, to support disability inclusion within research? Um, we then need to create an infrastructure um, that supports that inclusion for people with disabilities. Uh, we may maybe need to make some adaptations across studies. We maybe need to do some extra work in terms of accessing information in different ways, assessing people in different ways, but still allowing you know, those, those clear, statistically proven clinical endpoints to come through you know, in, in an un unadulterated way. Um, but most important, and I think whichever minority community you come from, um, you will hear this, that you need to include people uh, with an authentic lived experience in these discussions. Um, and so people with disabilities need to be part of the solutions. Um, and then I think we all understand that quite often things don't um, get fixed or we don't know how well we're doing at fixing them unless we measure it. Um, so collecting and reporting disability related data on studies, both individual studies and collectively and organizationally um, is a very important step that we need to do. So we know how we can benchmark and how we can move forward. And finally here, I just wanted to mention, 
you know, we, we, we need to develop universal designs for testing for various methodologies. Um, you know, if you can't read your, your patient reported outcome, um, on, on your, bring your own device phone. Um, if you can't do your quality of life scoring, um, because it's written and, and it's maybe not translatable from an audio perspective or it's not magnifiable or is there a different way of doing it? We have to kind of build this in that variability in approach um, in order to make it more accessible. And I used the example earlier of, of uh, you know, if, if, if you're blind, um, then you can um, easily accommodate most of these things with current technology. And, and that's the other. There was some research done in the UK recently that showed that 90 percent of accommodations don't really cost organizations any money. A lot of them are built into the technology, and it is just a question of educating people. Um, so with those elements that I just highlighted to you, um, I think what do, what do we have to do to take these forward? So from, you know, one of the elements really is cultural competency training. Um, and by that, I mean people who are not part of that community need in a safe, um, respectful way to be educated, to be able to ask the difficult questions, you know, the silly questions, the ones that they might think may be offensive or not offensive. Um, and, and, but how do we do that um, either as a sponsor or a research organization um, or, or even a clinical institution? Um, we, you know, that, need, that training and, and awareness needs to be really at a site level and an IRB level. So one of the activities we could suggest is training in that area to deepen the under understanding um, of, of potentially exclusionary bias, essentially. And then we enhance access to that patient population. We increase enrollment opportunities. Um, and there's lots of upside to this. I mentioned accessibility and accommodation um, earlier. You know, we, do we assess our sites that we work with? Um, do we see that functionally they're okay? I mean, I know um, a, an assumption that is made often is that a hospital is fully wheelchair accessible. Um, my personal experience is that's not always the case, um, and and um, but the, but it's an assumption that it is. So do we need to survey? Do we need to do a physical assessment of some some places that we work with? Um, and ultimately, the patient experience is more pos positive. Their ability to participate is more effective, and and patients as our most important partners in research. You know they they have access and and their retention ultimately will be better. So we've got to mitigate the bias, um, both from a, um, an intellectual and a physical perspective. Um, we have to educate, we, we have to look and assess the protocols to optimize them, to make sure that we're not practicing exclusionary approaches. Um, and, and, and finally, on, on this um, slide here, I just wanted to talk about how do we understand and mitigate that intersectionality? If you, um, you know, if you're part of the LGBTQ plus community and you have a disability or you have some other intersectional crossover, how do we mitigate that? How do we think not just in one silo, but think, OK, this is a multifaceted individual. You know, how do we accommodate these various elements of, you know, of what we're looking at? So I have one final piece to talk to you about, really, and then I will be able to open this up for any questions. Um, and that's really just some short term, you know, I like to have what are the next steps that we can at least think about. Um, and in those short term considerations, I think the majority of protocols have, they have the exclusion criteria is an, indiv an individual who has a medical, psychological or social condition that in the opinion of the principal investigator would interfere with the patient's safety, obtaining form, informed consent or compliance with the study procedures, they can be excluded. That, that is a very broad church and, and it doesn't necessarily have any guidance. So things that we think would be beneficial to include in having a discussion around this is what about people with one or more conditions? How do we deal with this? You know, what age does that cause a problem? Is it a higher level of disability, which there is? Is the disability permanent or temporary? Is it acquired? 
or, 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 or is it derived from a medical problem or from birth? Um, you know, how many of our PIs, how many of our healthcare professionals, study nurses, study coordinators, have a disability, have insight in, into, into that population? And that just reinforces this point of authentic voices. You know, are our IRBs being overprotective and, and how can we help mitigate that? Um, and, and ultimately, is there training for people that, everybody that participates in running studies? Is there training on, on bias and non-inclusive practice? Because most people in my experience, they want to do the right thing, um, but sometimes they don't know what they don't know. Um, and so is it our responsibility to help support that? So I just wanted to thank you all for listening to me uh, in this discussion. I hope the technical challenge wasn't uh, too interfering. Um, and I would be open for any questions. Um, so I think... Um, Initially, initially a question around the sort of homogenous nature of how do we view um, disability. So, uh, you know, the question asked is, is, is what is there a problem with disability being viewed, um, you know, all the same? And, and, and absolutely. And I think if you asked any community, um, you know, if, if, you were, if you were part of a community, and you are categorized in a big um, category like LGBTQ plus or disability, there is a massive difference between that, um, uh, between those things. So it's very much individualistic and, and proportionate and, and, and understanding. So, so there may be medical conditions then that, that, that may limit um, people's participation, but, but we shouldn't broadly assume across the board that that's the case. So for me, as somebody with an acquired disability from a traumatic injury, um, I, I'm not a sick person. I don't have a medical condition per se. Um, my disability you know, is derived from, from trauma. But if I went to a research center and said I'd like to participate uh, you know, in this study that I saw, um, then, um, then um, the likelihood is I would be excluded just from you know, how people would look at me. Um, Hi, uh, David. Thank you. Um, some more questions for you. Thank you for answering yeah. that last one. Another question I have is, if industry could do one thing to improve inclusivity in clinical trials for disabled patients, what would you personally recommend? I think yeah, it 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 is a subject where you it it's how do you boil the ocean because because we're I I feel that we're at the starting point, but I think with all things, education and awareness raising that there is even a problem. I I think it has to be the starting point because like I say, most of us go into healthcare because we want to help and we want to make a difference and we want to make a better life for our patients. So I think this is just helping remove some of that unconscious bias through just raising awareness that did you know, you know, that this is a challenge. So that would be my first step on the on the journey. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, another question would be, it's uh, very, you mentioned it's a multifaceted issue. Do you then need to integrate, say, other group areas to tackle disability inclusion within clinical trials? So do, do I need to, sorry, other, other disciplines or other parts? I'm not sure I fully understand. Uh, other, so I, I, I presume this means that other, um, say, do we need to look at other areas that are rep underrepresented alongside disabilities because there could be some um, form of overlap? Yeah. 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 No. Absolutely. And 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 I think this is where it would be easier if if every category was homogenous, which is not, you know. And 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 I think that that um, we need to take these aspects, knowing that you know, it, it, you know, knowing that you would have disadvantage in society, 
you know, you as a you as a black woman, if you don't mind me using an example, compared to me as a white man, you know, I am a, I am in a much more privileged position than you are. You know, you as an able-bodied person versus me as somebody with a disability that puts me at a disadvantage. It's 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 not straightforward. But but if you what we do know from the research um, on intersectionality is is that if you add to this, it's additive and it makes it worse. The more that you have. So I think you can't take, if somebody comes in front of you and they're more one part of one or more of these disadvantaged communities, it should be triggering in somebody's head, I need special attention to make sure we get it right for this person. And listen to them, because my challenges as one person with a disability, you know, might be very limited compared to the next person sitting in a wheelchair you know, just to not assume that everybody is the same. Of course, thank you. That's a very great point. And as you said, you can't take one approach to everybody. Everyone has different um, advantages and disadvantages that we have yeah. to weigh equally. Thank you very much, David. You've had some really great points that I hope everyone has taken something away from. And it has been really great chatting with you today and having you on board. I really appreciate the help you have uh, at the appreci the contribution you've made today to the event. Um